as we are now recording uh, to the cloud. I greet each of you in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Uh, I hate to have had to go another extra day to do Bible study, but it's because we lost power on yesterday and we were unable uh, to get on. So it's no sense in trying to force it. It didn't happen. Uh, the power didn't come on until late, and it would have been way after our normal Bible study. But I'm grateful that each of you joined us on today. I'm really appreciative of that. Once again, we're always glad to see our, our own sister, uh, Sister Vernell and I, uh, Reverend uh, Bridget Houston. Uh, she's with us just about every other week now. Uh, whenever she can get on, Reverend Martin, she's with us. As you know, she's just finished her chaplaincy work, and she's uh, preparing herself to be a chaplain uh, in the hospital, and that's where she is now. So we're so glad to have you with us again today, Reverend Houston. Let us go ahead and to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to be with us during this hour of power, the hour of power as it relates to your Bible, for your Bible, your word, you are powerful. You are all powerful. You are omnipotent. You are omniscient. You are omnipresent. And we're just glad to be in your presence. Be with us now to continue to dialogue in the doctrine of angelology, which is the study of angels. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, with that said, let's go ahead. Uh, again, some of these theologians uh, I would like to use always, uh, if they're not theologians that I think that would be biblically sound, I would never even incorporate them. But we have here Dr. Ryra. Right I remember him, uh, Dr. Ryra, as uh, Dr. Ryra or as a professor that uh, when right I was came by. Uh, I'm steady. So what we're getting ready to do, uh, we appreciate him. He's a professor of so many books, and uh, we've got an opportunity to deal with him, uh, uh, dialogue with him. Uh, uh, as it relates to uh, the Word of God. So Dr. Rowry is a great person. And of course, you know, I say to you also, Dr. Howard Wilmington, another great theologian that shares the same biblical ideologies uh, as Reverend uh, Dr. Wayne Wooden. Uh, I'm appreciative of you today, and we are going to work together as scholars and I'm not just saying the three persons that I've just mentioned. I'm talking about you as scholars, because if you were not in uh, scholars, you wouldn't be on today. So you don't realize how much I appreciate your scholarship. Also, I have some books that's coming to you. Hopefully, maybe by the end of the year, we'll know if it, uh, we'll get it out this year. We hope we can. But uh, you're going to really appreciate these, these wonderful uh, individual inserts uh, with respect to each book of the Bible. Uh, it's a comprehensive, if you will. And I think, in fact, I know you would be most appreciative of it. Well, because it is Mother's Day coming up, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers that are here, that are on this line. Uh, you are the wind that's beneath our wing. And I appreciate you uh, to the fullest. Uh, I appreciate all mothers, but uh, we don't need to negate, uh, we don't need to downplay uh, uh, the beautiful authenticity of women of color. Uh, you are all through the Bible. And I want to let you know before I officially get started, I'm going to send out a calling post. And I want every person on this line and others 
to send in something with respect to mothers. Uh, I'm going to do preach today, as you know, I'll normally preach uh, on Thursday. And uh, I do my uh, recording to be uploaded for Sunday for YouTube. And one of the things we're going to do a little bit differently this time is I'm going to do a short homily. And the rest of it is relates to the rest of the message of the service on Sunday will be you, 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 and you. And the subject is going to be uh, like M dot, O dot, T dot, H dot, E dot, and R dot. And, and I'm going to have there with a colon the powerful, uh, the most powerful acronyms in the English language. And you, Reverend Martin, for M-O-T-H-E-R, uh, anybody, well, I'm just using you for example. What you would do, you would just simply have one minute. And we need to get that in by tomorrow. Don't you participate in it, Sister uh, Bridget. And you have one minute to get in one of the acronyms of mother. And as it relates to your mother, be it those persons who are alive, are those persons who are going to be with the Lord. You have one minute. For example, Reverend Martin, you may, you may use him. My mother was very meek. My mother was very mild. And you begin to tell us about your mother, and then you'll deal with Happy Mother's Day. You, Reverend, uh, you, Sister Banks, you may use um, T. My mother, M-O-T-H-T. My mother had a very tender heart, blah, 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 blah. And you begin to talk about uh, that she was tender-hearted, uh, she was thoughtful, she was truthful, and on down the line. And everybody will have a minute. Now we want to list your mother's name, and we want to give you about a minute to speak. And you'll be part of Sunday's worship service. That's what the Holy Spirit told me to do this time. I'm going to do a short harmony as it relates to the historicity. Of African American, uh, not African American, but women of color in the Bible. And I'm going to talk about how important they are in the Word of God. We want to celebrate them this Mother's Day. So I want to let you know Happy Mother's Day. You have between today, you can download it so it can be ad rock to Sister Chelsea by five noon uh, on tomorrow evening. And then you will be, uh, uh, we will see you uploaded on Sunday for the regular worship service. Does that make sense, Reverend Martin? Mm -hmm. does that, that, that does. I like that, that creativity in this. Yeah, well that's, I, well, that's what God told me to do. I wrestled with it. And the Holy Spirit told me we want to get everybody, men and women, Involved. Yes, it's and all they need to do is use one of the acronyms of mm -hmm. M -E -R, uh, and speak about your mother for a minute. Chelsea will put your mother's name on it uh, at the top, and you'll see the name. Mm -hmm. And you can begin to talk about a minute as it relates to your mother, live beautiful. or if she's going to be with the Lord. So that's yeah, beautiful. What, beautiful. I wanted to say that because uh, so many people do not realize uh, how important people of color are as it relates to uh, the essentialness of them in the Bible. Uh, uh, when we start looking at Ham, for example, some ignorant people, ignorance, would say Ham is dealing with curse. And when we look at the Hebrew word for Ham, it literally means black. It has nothing to do with a person being being uh, cursed, uh, uh, we can find that through various uh, ethnologists, the people that study ethnicity. So the various ethnologists, ethnologists as we go back uh, and read that and study that, particularly those of you who are scholars, will discover that Ham does not mean that we are cursed, which is one of the three signs, as you know, of Noah. Uh, why I'm on the runway 
uh, when we start looking at Jews, uh, I remember Dr. Kofer, uh, one of the uh, Old Testament emeritus professors of the ITC, uh, the seminary where I finished, uh, uh, majored in that. Uh, he was one of the great ethnologists as well. And one of the things that he shared, and I totally agree with his, his theological ideology, that uh, Jesus was not an African American as much as Jesus was a person of color. Uh, one of the things we need to understand, if we ever, if we ever get a chance to go, uh, we really plan to do it. We still may. But you never know what God will be able, what was, is going to do. But we wanted to take a group over to Jerusalem, and those that would go over there would see some authentic Jews of different uh, shades of color light-skinned Jews, um, Jews that look almost like Caucasians. You have Jews that look like perhaps my uh, skin color, and you also have some Jews that, that, is, that is blacker than black, and they are authentic Jews. So we need to understand, yes, Jesus was a person of color, but I don't go along with some people saying that Jesus was an African-American. I can't go with that because if, if I do that, for me, I, I would not be true uh, to my theology. So I just wanted to just share that as we move forward. Uh, but anyway, congratulations. Happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. And we just simply want to put some emphasis. About, I'm going to probably use about 10, 15, maybe 20 women that I'll be talking about today uh, who, uh, who did some outstanding things in the 66 books of the Bible. Another thing, since we're talking about mothers, I want to talk about this old notion, and I've mentioned it before, about uh, there were only men, again, that put the Bible together. Uh, it's based upon if a person understood theology, as if they understood bibliology. As you know, the Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And when we look at the bibliology and look at 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, uh, to me, that gives us the biblical reference that's needed to show uh, of the 1400 years uh, for the Bible to come together, which was AD 95, there were men and there were women. And whereas some folk are saying that they were all men and it and the Bible was man-made. And so we dispute that uh, 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 ideology. And I don't want to say theology because theology is the study of God. So if it was God, it was the, if it's the study of God, it would be the study of the Bible. And in 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, says that no scripture is given by one's private interpretation, but men that were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Greek word men there is anthropos, which means humankind and not the word anar. If the word was anar, A-N-E-R, anar, but I use the word anar, it literally means male. So if when we start looking at scripture and if it was anar, that means that all the scriptures were written by men, a male. But the Greek word there, instead of a nar, is two Greek words for man. One is anthropos and the other one is a nar. And if we look at the word a nar, it literally means men and women. So clearly of the 1400 years, of the 66 books of the Bible, of the 786,716 words, of the 31,301 verses, of the 1,189 chapters had men and women that were involved in putting it together. We know that because of what the scripture said. That's why it's so important to make sure that we have proper hermeneutic, not based upon one's private interpretation. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this, that no scripture, no scripture, no scripture, no scripture, no scripture. Remember now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Greek word inspiration there is the Greek word theos, theos is God, neustos means breathe, 
And therefore, when we look at it, it says then that all, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, that is from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture is God breathed. In other words, as we continue that, once again, in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, it simply says that knowing this, that no scripture of the all scripture that is God breathed is given by one's private, meaning humans, private interpretation. So my interpretation doesn't mean anything, and neither does yours. And that does not help anybody when we begin to try to uh, elicit our own interpretation when we begin to explain things in the Bible. That bothers me in Sunday school, it bothers me in sermons, and it bothers me in Bible study. Uh, uh, well, my interpretation, my, my interpretation is this, it's not based on your interpretation, nor is it based on my interpretation. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this, that no private interpretation, that no private is given by one, no scripture is given by one's private, there it is, private interpretation, but men and women that were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's very important to say that, that our interpretation doesn't mean anything. We have to make sure that we second Timothy, uh, we have to, uh, uh, Timothy uh, uh, chapter 2, 15, study to show thyself approved, uh, thyself approved unto God, unto God. If we approve unto God, we got to have it approved unto the Bible. The Bible is God. God is the Bible. And therefore, since that is the case, we have to make sure that we study to make sure that our approval is unto God. Then we can be work persons, not ashamed. Then we can rightly divide the word of truth. And in order to rightly divide it, the Greek word there, it means to cut it straight. In order for us to cut it straight, we have to do it according to the scriptures. Uh, does that make sense, uh, 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 Sister Russell? Uh, you do that every week in your Bible study. Don't get me wrong. I mean, on your Sunday school. But does that make sense? It can't be based on our private interpretation, but it has to be based upon us rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I just needed to share that. Uh, yes. yes, go ahead. Yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah, it's not about us. It's really not. It's not about us. That's why it's very important when we teach, when we preach, uh, we need to make sure that we stay with the text uh, that we're preaching on. Uh, it's not based on that. Somewhere down the line, as you remember this, uh, Reverend Houston, in your homiletics class, somewhere down the line in that sermon, you need to go back and share with us what the text you're saying. We, you need to explain the text that you had given us prior to your sermon. Is that right, Reverend Houston? Yes, that's that's right, I agree. Yeah, so that's all we're saying, everybody, is that uh, we have to make sure to do everything in our power to make sure that right we rightly divide the word of truth. So let's get right into it at 19 after the hour. One of the things, uh, just as the, uh, recap. If you notice, we start talking about chapters uh, 11 and 12, which are the only two chapters left in Daniel. But we were intentionally stuck when it started talking about this whole notion of angels, of angels, higher angels, ranking of angels. Who are these angels? And I asked the question to you scholars, uh, have we ever studied, I know we studied various doctrines, because I think we studied uh, the doctrine of soteriology, which means the study of salvation, hermardiology, the study of sin, uh, eschatology, the study of end times, demonology, the study of demons, um, uh, ecclesiology, the study of the church, Satanology, the study of Satan. Uh, 
and like I said, soteriology, the study of salvation. I think those are the ones we have studied with as it relates to biblical doctrine. But another biblical doctrine is angelology, which is the study of angels. So we've already checked out other parts of it uh, earlier. And what we want to do now is uh, continue the study. Uh, I've sent you the uh, handout uh, for our continuation of angelology, uh, as you can see on the screen, and it's dealing with page six uh, on the uh, handout that was sent to you. So let's dive right into it, uh, because angels were very important in Daniel. Daniel spoke of it. And so let's continue now with angelology. Did you know that angels have a personality? That means that angels have personal existence and possesses the quality or state of a being person. I think that's very important that we understand that these, these angelic beings that God made has a personality. And because uh, angels have a personality, I'm convinced because God created angels that angels know what you are feeling and, and, and know if you're this and know if you're that, know if you're feeling good and know if you're feeling bad. Uh, angels have a personality. Angels qualifies as personalities because they have these aspects of intelligence. They're very intelligent. They're emotional. They, they know when you're sad. They know when you're happy. And they have a will. Satan, of course, and demons possess intelligence as well. We find that in Matthew chapter 8, 29, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 1 Peter 1 and 12. Now, good angels, Satan, and demons show emotions. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 13, James chapter 2, 19, and you already know James 2, 19 says demons shudder at the name of Jesus. But anyway, good, there are good angels, brothers and sisters, and there are also bad angels. Good angels, Satan, and demons demonstrate that they have will. I told you that before. We can look at that Luke 8, 28 through 31, 2 Timothy 2, 26, and, you, and Jude 6. You can deal with that on your leisure or at your leisure. Therefore, they can be said to be persons. The fact that they do not have human bodies does not affect their being personalities. And you all can excuse the typo. That's my typing affect that person, that being personality, any more than it does God. Now, angels are not omniscient. In other words, they are not all known. Contrary to what a lot of people say, the angels know this, the angels know that. That is not true. Angels are not omnipotent. Angels are not omniscient. Angels are not omnipresent. And angels are not immutable. Uh, they change not. The bottom line is angels get their power and authority from God. They do not know all things as God does. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 tells us yet, yet they seem to have greater knowledge than humans. So why do you think that is? And I'm so glad you asked. I don't know what to do. Well, there are possible, three possible things possibly uh, that they are a little bit more knowledgeable than human beings. Number one, angels were created as a higher order of creatures in the universe than humans are. Number two, angels know more about God than humans do. James chapter 2, 19, Revelation 12, 12. And thirdly, angels gain knowledge through long observation of human activity. In other words, unlike humans, y'all, angels do not have to study the past, they have experienced it. Therefore, they know how others have acted and reacted in situations and can predict with great degree of accuracy how we may act in similar situations. I'm gonna stop it there with number three and I want us to somewhat unmute. Let me get you to do it, Sister Russell. Angels gain knowledge through long observations of human activity. In other words, unlike humans, Angels do not have to study the past because they have experienced it. 
What does that mean to you? Well, angels have been here and with God and they were messengers of God. So they have a different relationship than the humans do. Right. A angels uh, are God's, mo most of them, well, we know that Satan was an angel and uh, before he was kicked out of heaven. So, so they've been here before God even uh, created uh, humans. That's and exactly so, a good statement to leave it on. They have been here when they, uh, they were created before humans is right. Now, even though they have a will, angels, they are like other creatures, subject to who? The will of God. Good right. angels are sent by God to help believers, according to Hebrews 1, 14. Good angels are sent by God to help believers in Hebrews 1, 14. Satan, the more, the most powerful and cunning in carrying out his purpose in this world is limited by the will of God, according to Job chapter 2, verse 6. Demons, too, have to be subject to the will of Christ. Luke chapter 8, 28 through 31. And I want to talk about that for a minute. It's because a lot of people tend to give Satan and demons too much power. They only get their power uh, and, and their ability to do whatever through God. If you remember in Job, in the book of Job, God says, have you considered the whole oh, Satan, Satan in the Hebrew literally. So he was really talking about Satan and not Satan. So excuse me there, because Satan is in the New Testament. That's the Greek word. And Satan is the Hebrew word. Again, Satan, uh, what we get uh, with the Greek word Satan in the New Testament is diab uh, diabolos, what we get the word diabolical. And Satan in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word Satan. So Satan, he said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? You can do whatever you want to do with him. Look at that now. God, God, Yahweh, the action God, is given uh, Satan uh, 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 permission to deal with Job. He said the only thing about him is you can't touch his body now. You can do everything else, but I'm not going to let you do that because God had a hedge. He had a hedge around Job as it relates to that. So I just want to, and also in Luke and other, in the, in the uh, gospel, you saw what happens to uh, uh the demon that ended the, uh, the man in the garrison, if you all remember that, over 6,000 makes up legion in the, in the Roman army. Now, legion is literally 6,000. And when the demons, the demonic man, the demoniac man said to Jesus, who was really minding his own business, he said, what do you have to do with me, Jesus? And Jesus will, if you allow me to stretch the muscles of my imagination, Jesus will say, man, what are you talking about? I'm minding my business, going on, you need to go on about your business. He said, wait a minute, what's your name? My name is Legion, but we are many. The word Legion, in the Romans there, he was thinking about Legion, that means that's an army of 6,000. So it was over 6,000 demons in this name. And the reality is the Lord basically was saying, you allow me to stretch the muscles of my imagination. Man, that's not your name. Come on out of him, demon. Just come out of him right now. Come on out of him. Because God is God who created angels. Remember now, who created all of this. Come out of him right now. And when the demons came out of this man, Notice what the scripture said. The scripture said that the demons ask Jesus, who is omnipotent and they are not, who's omniscient and they are not, who's omnipresent and they are not, who's immutable and they are not. These demons ask him, will you, he word, allow us, allow us, allow us to come into the swine? What happened? They asked God for per 
mission through Jesus Christ. I just said something very important. Same thing with us today. Since we are blood washed and we are blood bought in Jesus Christ, we are connected to the body of Christ. Demons and Satan does not have to stay with you. They have no power when it comes to you. You've got to give them permission to stay in you. And God said, Jesus Christ, I tell you what to do. Yes, you have my permission to go into the swine. Because remember, when we studied demonology, I shared with you, which is another biblical doctrine, that demons have to be busy. And they jump from one to the other, to the other, to the other. So demons have to be busy. It's in their nature to cut up and get into stuff. And they got into the swine, and according to scripture, they all drowned in that very steep, steep bank into the water. They have to get permission to stay in you. Now, that was God. No, that's you also. Because when Jesus got up, you also got up. Because Jesus lived, you also live. They have to ask permission to stay in you. And that's why it's important to rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Rebuke them in the name of Jesus. James chapter 2, 19 says, demons shudder at the name of Jesus. But anyway, with that said, angels, demons, assuming they are fallen angels, and Satan belong to a class of beings that may be labeled as spiritual beings. Remember now, in Ezekiel chapter 28, 14 through and following, there we see uh, where one third of the angels were kicked out of heaven with Lucifer. Again, Lucifer is part of the sheriff angel. We'll cover that later. Uh, but they were kicked out of heaven because Lucifer wanted to be like God. And the Bible tells us in Exodus that the Lord says, God says in the book of Exodus, in the Ten Commandments, that he will have, he's a jealous God, and God is a jealous God, that God will have no other God before me. So he kicked him out of heaven, and his name changed from Lucifer, which means the anointed cherub, that means singular. When I say cherubim, that means plural. But anyway, the anointed cherub, which is Lucifer, was kicked out. And we were kicked out along one third of the angels that followed him was kicked out as well. Because they tried to do exactly what Lucifer uh, tried to do. When Lucifer tried it, they thought they would try it. So God kicked Lucifer which name was changed from, uh, I mean, as long as he was Lucifer, he was fine. But then the name changed and we was kicked out to Satan in the Hebrew, Diabolos in the Greek, Satan in English, Slewfoot William. And they kicked him out. And, and then Paul then picked it up years later in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, when he said that, and, and Satan, I actually Satan here, became the small letter God of this world. I just need to give you the historicity of that. And since you are a biblical scholar, I think it's very important for us to realize and recognize uh, uh, the truth. On John 8, 31 and 32, if you follow my teachings, you are my disciples indeed. And then you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So it's important for us when we see it, we need to make sure that we share it uh, in the agape love that God would want us to have. But we need to share in our own way that Lucifer is not a bad name. Lucifer means the anointed sheriff, which is the highest angelic angel next, which is a high angelic angel and the highest being the archangel whose name is Michael, which is the only archangel. And we'll study that a little later. So I'm saying that to say to you how important it is uh, to not say, to not say, uh, here's Lucifer. That ain't nobody but old Lucifer. 
Now imagine that down here now. Now remember now Lucifer was kicked out of hell. That ain't nobody but Lucifer. Lucifer, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, Lucifer. No, 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 no. Lucifer is a good name. So it shows one's biblical ignorance when persons begin to say Lucifer, you're rebuking Lucifer. Because Lucifer means the anointed sheriff, which is a good name. All right. Having said that, demons, angels are said to be ministering spirits. In Hebrews 1.14, demons are called evil and unclean spirits. Luke chapter 8, verse 2. Luke chapter 11, verse 24 and 26. And Satan is the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And you know, there you'll find, oh, yeah, uh, when you look at Ephesians, where he was the prince of the air. Sometimes angels were seen by human beings, okay? This seems to suggest that angels have bodies. However, the spirit, the scriptures explicitly call angels and demons spirits. Now, sometimes they have bodies. Sometimes these, uh, we, we know that. We can go back to the scripture, what said these two human bodies uh, were on the porch during the Sodom and Gomorrah story, if you remember that. These were human bodies, yet they were angels. So they do have human bodies, but, but most of us understand angels and demons as spirit, meaning pneumata, which means spirit, or where we get the word pneuma, spirit, or where we get the word pneumata, a pneumonia, that means breath. The English word, which, uh, when we hear the words, somebody has pneumonia, that's a Greek word that means there's something going on with their breath. So angels and demons have spirit, pneumata, in Matthew chapter 8, 16, Luke chapter 7, 21, Luke uh, chapter 8, 2, Luke chapter 11 and 26, Acts chapter 19, 12, Ephesians chapter 6, 12, and, Eph and Hebrews chapter 1, 14. Though God is also a spirit being, this does not mean that angels are infinite in nature as God is, whether they are finite spiritual beings. Just like we are finite, they are spiritual beings but they are finite spiritual beings, meaning that the only one that is infinite is God. Neither does their spirit nature forbid the appearing of human beings. Now, this is very important. Usually they appear, excuse my uh, 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 typo, as males, though possibly the women of Zechariah chapter five, verse 19 are also angels. You need to check that out for yourself. This validates the fact that there are men and women angels. We are at Mother's Day, and they always stand at these men. Now, this was one of the questions, sister, sister, uh, brothers and sisters and brothers, that, that, that people were asking. Are all of the angels are uh, men? And so from what I've been reading as it relates to some of my uh, uh, investigation, and when I began to observe it and study it, I discovered that we need to start looking at this thing in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 9, uh, as it relates to women. Angels appear in dreams, and they also appear in vision. We know that because Matthew tells us that in Matthew 1, 20, and Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Remember, in Isaiah, it deals with two particular rankings, if you will. Uh, two angelic angels, uh, angelic beings, uh, division of angels. Isaiah chapter 6 deals with this, the, 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 the seraphim as well as the seraphim, the cherubim and the seraphim. Anytime you see I am at the end of the Hebrew word, it always usually means plural. An angel, so an angel appears in the dream and vision. We can again Isaiah 6 in the year of King Uzziah, not Uzziah, but in the year of King Uzziah's death, I also saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up, and his train filled the temple. 
and he began to talk about the sheriff. He, he, it gives a, a vivid description of the cherubim as well as the seraphim. Involved in it. So now, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, 1 through 8 tells us that as well in special unveiling of their presence in 2 Kings 6, 17 and to people in a normal, conscious, walking state. Angels uh, appear there in Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 8, Mark chapter 16, verse 5, Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Now, again, my brothers and sisters, the number of angels is and always will be the same. There are a lot of people out there that talk about these angels and how these angels had baby angels and they had baby angels and they have baby angels and they have baby angels. That's not true according to biblical scholars and according to, uh, as we study uh, biblical history, the, the number of angels is and always will, notice I put it in, in, in bold, be the same. The Lord taught that angels do not propagate baby angels. We'll find it in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. Let's, and, and, and they do not die according to Luke chapter 20, verse 36. Let's look at both of those so that we can make sure that we are biblically correct. Would you look at that, uh, Sister um, uh, Joyce? If you would just look at, uh, take your time, and I want you to look at Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. And then uh, if you, Sister uh, Bridget, would you look at Matthew, uh, 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 yeah, you look at Luke chapter 20, verse 36. Josh, you 22, verse 30 of Matthew, and Bridget, you Luke chapter 20, verse 36. What we're trying to ascertain here to see if they, to show in scripture that they do not propagate baby angels. And what, that's what you're going to prove, Sister George, and Sister Bridget, you're about to prove that they do not die. Luke 20, 36. Are you there, Sister Joyce? Sister Piggy, she muted. She muted. Sorry. Is she muted? Sister Joyce, are you there? Yeah, she's muted. All right, let's go on. And uh, Sister Daisy Bank, will you pick that up, please? Matthew twenty-two thirty. Very interesting. Okay, right? Matthew 22, 30. Right. Take your time to Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. Matthew 22, 30. Um, And said, if we had been in the days of our father, we would not have been partaking with them in the blood of the prophet. Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong verse. No, that don't sound right there. That's, uh -uh, that's 22. That's 23. Oh, okay. For, the, for, in, the for in the resurrection... Thirty. In the resurrection, they are neither married nor are given in marriage. In marriage, uh huh. That are as the angel of God in as the heaven. angels of God in heaven. They do not die as well. And Christ proclaims existence of angels which uh, the Sadducees uh, uh, deny it. 
because they don't believe a Sadducee in the resurrection. That's the context in which you were talking about. But in the way, go on and let's look at the next one. Sister, what do you have there? Okay, Luke, um, chapter 20, verse 36 says, and they will never die again. In this, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, um, and they will never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. So I just wanted you to know, it's not just like us that they, I'm just trying to prove, Reverend Martin, that they will never uh, die. However, the wicked angels will be punished in a place of separation from God, according to Matthew 25, verse 41. Matthew, again, verse 20, chapter 24 and 25 is known as the Olivet Discord. And we can find it again in Luke chapter 8, 31. Let's continue to move on. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Why would they say that uh, sometimes you will uh, uh, entertain an angel? If you entertain an angel, would that be a human? Yeah, what they're saying is that sometimes angels come in a human form. Okay, but if they come in human form, that be, means that they could they could be here is what they're really saying is that we need to be careful because sometimes God places angels. I don't know about the rest of you, but let me just stretch a little bit here. Uh, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, uh, Sister Daisy. I've had it in my life. And I was, I should never forget, I was traveling somewhere. I think I might have been coming to school or something. I was very tired. And whatever the case was, um, uh, anyway, I was in the store. And I never should ever get out. I stopped and got me a Coca-Cola. And I think I got me a late, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, what is that candy? Uh, uh, what is that candy, honey, that I get sometimes? Coke and uh, uh, Baby Ruth or whatever it was. But anyway, I would stop, and, and what happened is there was some really bad danger uh, that was going on uh, at the place where I was supposed to be going to. And the bottom line is I went up to that person. They said, you really need to go uh, this direction uh, uh, and something of that nature. I can't remember it just right off, but I remember my seminary days. And when I got back to find that person, I didn't see that person. I'm just speaking about me now. I'm just talking about me. I didn't see that person get no car. I didn't see him do nothing. All I know is when I went the other way, it was so much because it was major danger and people, and there was someone got killed right there at that very spot in that area where I was supposed to go. That has happened in my life. I, I, I consider those people to be angels to me, uh, Sister uh, Banks. I, I really did not see it. I know I wasn't crazy. Uh, I wasn't drunk. I'm just, here to, <laughs> I'm just here to tell you that I saw, I'm telling you that something happened uh, and through that person, I went back to look at that person again. That person was gone. No car. I didn't see nothing. I went all through that store looking for her, but it could just be me. And then, so therefore, I'm sensitive when it said it could be angels unaware. I would do an extensive uh, exegesis on that next time to make sure that I'm correct. But I think that that's what they're speaking of, Sister uh, um, Daisy. What do you think, um, uh, Reverend Houston? What do you think? Be careful how we entertain strangers because they could be angels unaware. I agree. I've also had some experiences where I, I believe that uh, it was an angel working in human form. So, yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah, I, I believe that. What about it, Reverend Martin? Have you experienced that in your lifetime? I have in some form or another. Um, the feeling that I think I shared with you about the story about those kids that came through here who didn't have any food. And then I fixed it, let them go. And then before they got too far up the street, I ran to the door and asked them to come back because I remember that verse about be careful because you might be entertaining angels. But I do believe that they are. And just like in the, um, when the angels was in 
Solomon and Gomorrah, they yeah. were in the of human. So I, I think it's possible. Well, there you go. That, that's your biblical reference right there because they were definitely human beings. Because, they, you know, I don't know if they had had wings and all of this kind of stuff on. And that's why people make the mistake when they ain't Everybody supposed to have wings on to be an angel. And, you know, I don't think that those guys uh, who really love those, those handsome men, I don't think they would have wanted them as much. They wouldn't have been as attractive to them had they had a lot of wings and all of this stuff on. What do you think about it, Reverend Martin? That's just me. I don't think that they, I think they would say, wait a minute, I'm scared of these folks. And then particularly if they start flying and all of that kind of stuff, or flapping their wings, <laughs> I'm almost sure that they say, I don't want to be bothered with that. But these men were handsome and they were, they were, they had it going on like a neck bone. And they looked at them, they said, he's a man, why don't y'all take these men, women? I got two girls that are virgins that never knew a man. I will yeah. give them to you. But these two men on this porch, I'm responsible for them. In those days, they took they took guests very seriously. And they believe, in, and if you come to 104 Rodenwood, uh, uh, Sister Bridget would know this, who visited us not only here, Miss Reverend Martin, but she's visited us in, in, uh, in Durham, North Carolina. And whenever people stay here with Burnell and Wayne, we take care of you. You are our special guest. You're not just a regular visitor here. And I do the same thing, and I believe in that in the church. I don't believe in you going to a church building and you have church members that are there and some people come in and you treat them like visitors. They're not visitors. These people thought enough of us to come to our church and be a part of us. And therefore, I believe that they should be guests and not visitors. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, so we, we are responsible. Them, right, we ought to treat them like guests. So the Bible gives little specific evidence about the original state of the angel. Though we know that when God finished God's work of creation, God pronounced everything to be good in Genesis chapter 1, 31, Jude chapter, and Jude chapter 6 also indicated that originally all angels were holy creatures. Originally, every one of them were holy creatures. Some were elect in 1 Timothy 5, 21, and others sinned in 2 uh, Peter 2 and 4. We can clearly see that some sinned when some of them tried to follow Lucifer, who was kicked out. One third of them sinned. No human being can ever count the number of angels, Sister Bank, that exist. Some folks may think they can, but you can't count the number of angels that exist. Some suggest that there are many angels in the universe as the total number of human beings throughout history, possibly implied in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. The bottom line is, y'all, whenever, whenever the number of angels existed in the beginning, in uh, Genesis 3.24, which is the cherubim, it's the same number of angels that existed now through Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Now, why did I do that? That's my own writing and stuff. So I put that in here to let you know that Genesis chapter 3, 24 is when the angels, first time we heard of the angels in the Bible. It's the cherubim. How did we know the cherubim? Because the cherubim were guard and they guarded the Garden of Eden after, after Slewfoot had gotten into Adam and Eve and to keep them out, God used cherubim angels to keep them out of there in the Garden of Eden. So that's why I chose Genesis chapter 3, 24. And of course, it, you can see it again at the end of the 66th book. Before you conclude in verse 21, Genesis 22, 21, conclude the entire Bible. But in verse 20, uh, verse 16, of um, Revelation uh, chapter 22 talks about for the last time angel of the cherubim. Now, my brothers and sisters, there, there, are, there are bad angels and there are good angels. I mentioned that. 
one third of the bad angels, along with Satan, as I told you, were thrown out a kick out of heaven in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 17. And according to a theologian by the name of Dr. Strong, bad angels shuts us up to fight as the only being who is able to deliver us uh, others from the enemy of all good. And good angels, he said, gives us a sense of greatness of the divine resources and of God's grace in our creation. In other words, to think of the multitude of unfallen intelligence who, who executed the divine purpose before man, meaning humankind, appeared. And good angels strengthen our faith in God's providential care to know the spirits of so high rank are disputed to minister to creatures who are environed with temptation and a conscience of sin. That's according to Dr. Strong. Again, uh, our angels, like everything else, was created by God at 56 absolute hours. The Father, through Jesus Christ, in the energy of the Holy Spirit. Angels, said again, like everything else, was created by God. Each angel is therefore, what? A direct creation from God. No wonder they are referred to as the sons of God. I needed to write that down because a lot of people were wondering about that. What does that mean in the Hebrew language? The sons of God. We find, a, we find examples uh, of this in Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2 and 4, and in Job chapter 1, verse 6, and Job chapter 2, verse 1. It talks about this whole notion of, of, of uh, um, the sons of God and what they're speaking of here are the angels. So, well, so as we continue to read at 57 of the hour, Old Testament reading, we see the words angel are uh, angels in first, in what? In Genesis chapter 1, 1 and 2, and Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, and Psalm 148, verse 2 and 5. This is where we find the word angel. In these verses, notice the word host. The word host, not only the son of uh, uh, that we talk about the sons of God, but there's another word for angels that's called host. In the New Testament, we find some scriptures, passages mm. regarding angels, namely, but not exhaustive to say the least, in John chapter 1, 1 through 3, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, and Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16. Now, when we, when we are created now, when were angels created? When were angels created? I think that's a good stopping point that we need to pick that up as we begin at the bottom of page number 11. And we will open up next week with when are angels created? When were there? When were they created? So I think y'all to a good start, my brothers and sisters, as we continue to study uh, in connection with Daniel, angelology in connection with Daniel chapter 11 and 12 and see how they are both inextricably intertwined as it relates to the higher rankings of the ranking of angels at 59 of the hour. Is there, are there any questions whatsoever what we've studied thus far with regards to uh, the angels. Anybody have any questions? You raise an excellent yes. Pastor, I just want to say how much I appreciate you taking this time out to explain to us about Angel because I was curious when I asked you about it because I have these women angels and small miniature women angels. And the only thing we were hearing were about the men angels. So I was curious as whether or not I didn't take my women angels down. So I think they're going to stay up a little longer now. I think you are. I think they are going to stay up. And they'll yeah. stay up for the rest of your life. I think okay. you're right. That's yeah, a thank you. point. Thank you very, very much. I'm appreciative yes, so much. And I'm so grateful uh, to have such wonderful uh, scholars that are on 
this Bible study that takes the word of God very seriously. Anybody else as we're about to go ahead and close out and pray? At one o'clock of the hour, would you close us out, Reverend Mark? Let us pray. Oh, our Father, our protector, we just praise your holy name. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the dedication of your servant, our pastor. Thank you for things that he's teaching us that we probably would have had to pay a lot of money to get, but God, through you and his knowledge, we just thank you for him. Bless everybody's on this, this uh, virtual call today. Bless them individually and collectively. Bless those that are here and those that wanted to be, but they are not for some reason. We pray that you continue to bless us through this day. And we just want to say we thank you for your protection through this week and keeping us away from the being home from the, 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 the storms. And we pray that you continue to hold us in the palm of your hand and continue to bless us, Lord, in a mighty way. And we love you and we glorify you. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So thank you so much. Before you all leave, I want to thank, uh, we, we want to thank the Lord for what the Lord has done. It was a serious tornado that come to me yesterday. It was very serious, very yeah. serious, but I want to let you know uh, that God is faithful and God took care of us. This day, I don't know if anybody, they said there were no deaths or casualties uh, from what I hear in the whole state, uh, in this area. And, but it was a major tornado uh, that came through here and several people are still without lights. So we praise God for what God has done and we thank God for God's protection. Uh, let me uh, uh, 